I don't know. So this other Zoom link worked. I don't know. Okay. Go back to my microwave. I think I'll do the toaster oven now. Okay. <laughs> oh my God. I just read Gary just told me that the people scheduled for shots today may not get them. So Ellen, I wonder, did Ellen say whether she was getting her shot? I she was in the, she was in the car. Of the no, because the weather, they couldn't deliver the vaccines. So oh, people no. who were scheduled yesterday and today uh, might not be getting their shots. Oh gosh. And they have Mr. to reschedule, Point. reschedule, mm. try that one. <laughs> where, where were they getting them? Well, Ellen was going to Cicero. Um, <sighs> actually, both of them. Yesterday, my friend was going to Cicero, and today, Ellen's going to Cicero. So I don't know what's going on there. All right. <laughs> Um, so I first, um, I know a few people will come in. I want to read you what um, Judith Cornick, she was the visitor from Connecticut. She said, it was a pleasure to listen to your Macomb Salah Lakeside group discussion for a short st story. Oh, that's Marilyn. Hello? <laughs> yes. Can you not get in? Okay, I'm sending you the link. <laughs> I'm glad I, I to send you another link. I, I, I knew that's what she wanted. It's a carry my, and that's what it is. Okay. So I'll keep multitasking here. And, um, and she said, what an insightful, enthusiastic women in your short story group. I learned a great deal about the story this morning. You did an excellent job organizing the discussion and giving one everyone a chance to participate. Your experience as a Jewish camp professional, a religious school teacher, a supervisor enriched the discussion. I hope you will enjoy um, discussing the place at your next meeting. Our short story discussed it a couple months ago. We enjoyed it greatly. We learned from our discussion that one of our members had worked in the office of a factory in New York City, like the one portrayed in the story when she was a young woman. Other women had shopped for clothes in New York City in similar factories with their mothers when they were children. So, <laughs> I, it was a lovely note, and I can't wait to start talking about um, uh, the place because, Jesus. let me just send off this email to Marilyn. Um, um, because, uh, you know, full transparency, my grandmother, Florence, had, and, you know, they called it a schmat, the Schmata business. And um, she had a store called Shirley Frocks on Jackson. And she oh. ran it for a long, long, long time. And I remember going there and playing in the racks. And um, we, you know, as we got older, we would, we would get some dresses there. But it was um, like her customers were Walmart, Kmart. So... You know, it was, I did not get my bat mitzvah dress there. I, I will tell you that, did not get it there. All right, so let's talk a little bit about Edith. Edith Rubin Kanicki was born in Brooklyn, New York, the daughter of Harry and Elizabeth Smith Rubin. Her father, the quintessential self-made man, had escaped the pogroms in Eastern Europe, immigrating to America, where he would become a prosperous dress manufacturer. This distant, driven character would feature prominently in two of Konecki's most acclaimed novels, Allegra Maud Gold Goldman, um, 1976, and A Place at the Table, 1989. And when I looked her up, and I'll show you what she looks like in a hot minute, um, first it said she wasn't dead, and then it said she <laughs> died in 2019. So, <laughs> you know, Maybe Wikipedia wasn't up to That's date. a conversation. Yeah. Um, her writing career began in high school when she won her first writing prize. Then she went on to New York University for two years, leaving before graduation. In 1944, Edith Rubin married Murray L. Knicky, and together they would have two children, Michael and Joshua. Even as she entered into her life as suburban mother in the 50s, Edith Knicky could not stop writing, using her daily experience as fodder for her short stories. She returned to school, graduating from Columbia in 61. 
Only a year later, she won a Yado Fellowship, giving her space both mentally and physically to focus on her writing. Um, Kaniki and her husband divorced in 1963, um, and she came out as a lesbian. Her coming out process partially infused her next well-received novel, A Place at the Table. She has continued to publish into the 21st century and the Jewish Woman's Archives notes, Edith Kanicki, despite a small body of work, can lay claim to a large literary achievement. She gives voice to a particular generation of women whose lives spanned a period of tremendous social, political, and economic change. So, um, what say you? Did you did you like the story? I did. Well, I liked it. Thank you. Lynn, go ahead. Well, my father owned a jacket manufacturing company in Chicago, and that was um, my life growing up. Um, Sometimes I would go there, he'd take me there on a Saturday afternoon and I'd turn cuffs for the, uh, for the jackets. And um, people seemed uh, happy, satisfied, but it's interesting, um, the union started to squeeze him uh, eventually and he moved his factory uh, to a small town in Indiana. Mm -hmm. And then he came home on weekends. So this story sort of um, hit me in the heart. And also he used to farm us out to different, these different people he knew in the garment industry um, to get jackets, to get dresses, to get, so I, you know, I could totally identify um, with her. And I, I think the owner of a, Man, though he didn't seem like he was involved in, in the making of the garments. My father, uh, I should say, was at the uh, at University of Illinois getting, uh, wanting to be an engineer. His father died and he had to come home and take over the business. And I don't think he was ever delighted with that. So that's a, that's a whole other story. But um, this story really hit me. Um, and I think, again, there are lots of layers in this story. And, uh, uh, superficially, if you look at the surface, it just is a nice split. But I think there's a lot to talk about in this story. Uh, agreed. I am not surprised. Um, for those who came on, I said that my grandmother was in the Schmata business. Then, Rochelle, you'll be next. Um, I, I, I expected to have a couple of people on who um, have some experience or families in the dress business or cutting because that's what everybody did. It was predominantly a Jewish industry, and um, I had a great uncle who was a cutter, and um, so it, I'm not I'm not surprised. Rochelle, what were you going to say? Oh, first of all, Judy Biederman couldn't get in. I just oh, okay. want you to know that. So okay. I don't know what the problem is, but I wanted right. you to know. Thank uh, you. But this was a, th a story about the 50 in the 50s, wasn't it? I mean, I remember my mother taking me. Um, for coats to downtown to, I guess they were factories or showrooms. And it, so this brought back some memories. I think all my girlfriends, and I think some of the guys too, even, I think maybe my husband even had a grace jacket, if anybody yes. remembers that, G-R-A-I-S. Yes. So it brought back a lot of memories, but um, this story wasn't the happiest story. I, I got a kick out of reading it for certain reasons, but um, it sort of left me feeling bad for the girl. And um, I thought her parents really were not the best uh, parents in the world. And she was going through such a stage. No, 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 no. I sent you a new one. I sent you a new one. But it, it, was, it was really, it was, bye -bye. it was an interesting story to read. And I agree, it had, did have lots of layers in it. So, uh, but, but oh my God, we always used to go down for coats. I can remember exactly what the coats were, you know, and you, you just had to get it there. I never got dresses in those places, but 
Um, I was very small at the time and, and well, they just didn't fit me, but like her, <laughs> they, they, could, they couldn't be hemmed or, or taken in that much. But we, we just didn't try that so much. But for coats all the time, spring coats, winter coats, and brought back a lot of memories. Um, Abby, go ahead. I, I really enjoyed it, probably on, the, on more on a superficial level. I didn't go through the different layers. But it kind of reminded me of um, the parents on uh, Mrs. Maisel. Well, uh, <laughs> yes. That's what I was visualizing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the other thing that um, I thought brought back a lot of memories, and I may be, I don't, you know, I don't think, I remember it's, it's the uh, the elevator operators. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I was a little kid, we came to my grandma, and I was entranced by that job. I thought that was the best job ever. And, you know, pulling it and rolling it to the floor. And sometimes it wouldn't be right at the floor. And, you know, my kids don't know anything from that. I have to ask, I don't even know if Arthur, my husband, I mean, it's because I went to, um, you know, you know, I went to her store. Um, did somebody else? Um, Lynn? Whites and then yeah. um, can you hear me? Yeah, yes. I always feel like I do it wrong. I can't explain. Anyway, <laughs> I felt her agony because you know, as an adolescent and shopping, and there's these men walking through, and she has to try on clothes she doesn't even want to try on. And I just remember how hard it was when you're an adolescent, you know, especially junior high and going shopping with my mother. I mean, I just remember that. And the other thing is, um, as far as a cutter, I may have mentioned this. My grandfather worked for Hart Schaffner and Marx from when he graduated high school till he retired. He was a cutter. And he could cut the things. He used to cut the Thanksgiving table, uh, turkey <laughs> at the table because he was such, he was so good at a cutter. Being a cutter. <laughs> so I thought I'd add that. But yeah. I thought... <laughs> Absolutely. I felt her agony. I hate to say it. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Um, uh, there was someone else. Um, Andy. Yeah. Um, well, I, I did like this story and I liked it because it had something to tie me to that place that I could think about. Um, although we didn't have any cutters, but, <laughs> um, but I, what I thought was that those times were so constricting and either you liked the dresses or in her case, she didn't. And your body had to be a certain way and you had to have a certain aspiration. And I, I, it, I mean, I guess it worked for a lot of people who could fit into that, but, um, but so many really couldn't. And, um, and I felt badly because she didn't even enjoy pretty dresses. At least I liked that kind of stuff. You know, I thought it was fun to go to this one store on Lawrence Avenue. That's where my mother loved. And, you know, for the high holidays or whatever, that's what we did. We got our coats at Best in Company. They got passed down, and that's how we did things. Because you know, people didn't shop at a million stores; they did it twice a year, something. And it was uh, very confining. You know, it brought back some memories. I felt badly for her because she didn't. Yeah, really and of course, um, Elaine, and then Brenda. But we also find out later she came out as a lesbian. She made. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. She probably didn't even want to wear a dress. Right, I was thinking that during the story. I wonder yeah. if she was a lesbian. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Elaine, go ahead. Okay, my I was raised by my grandparents and my grandparents originally had a shoe store, but by the time I was born, the shoe store was gone. But my grandmother was a crocheter and my grandmother crocheted a skirt for me with like a uh, suspender. And every year she would add a layer of crochet. Now, I was, as we all can imagine, a chubby little child and hated this crocheted skirt. And when I'm reading the story about how she tried on the dresses and they had to be taken, it brought back all of the layers of this crocheted skirt. And that's all I had. I thought it was a, a very um, reminiscent story of our lives and our times. It, when we were all growing up, it was something definitely to identify with. 
Yeah. Um, uh, Brenda, you need to, and then Lynn Salad. I remember, I have two memories. One, going to a milliner because hats were sort of important, especially for the high holidays. I remember that. And who, I mean, no, there is, there is no milliner anymore. And I, I remember going with my husband to Eric Sam on um, Devon and around Lincoln and Devon. And he would try on a suit and then they would have the, um, the, the, the fitter come in and they would take chalk and they would cuff it. And, and um, it, was, it was just, a, you know, it, it would fit just perfectly. And uh, I miss having a store like that. They, there just isn't anything like that anymore. Yeah, um, and my mom used to go, we lived in Crystal Lake. She also went to Devon. And although there's not milliners, there are people who make hats, especially for the from community, because they wear a lot of hats. Uh -huh. Okay, Lynn and then Alice. Well, this story brought up a very painful memory for me because <clears throat> we had a friend who lived around the block um, who was in the dress business, who, you know, sold a line of dresses. And so my mother said, let's go over there and see if we can find a graduation dress for you from eighth, for eighth grade. So I was short, as you can imagine. And then we found this dress that was like size 14. <laughs> and um, my mother said, oh, this is going to work. <laughs> so we found this little Italian dressmaker in the neighborhood. And I went for fittings. Okay, on this dress that must have been like ten dollars, and the pain of trying to get that dress to fit my body was unbelievable. All right, and I, as I'm seeing her, um, I, I felt that scene was so indicative of what the story was all about. They're trying to adjust her life, you know. They're trying to control who she is by getting this dress to fit this body that just won't accept it. And then the guy says, stuff your, you know, stuff, get a bra and stuff it with socks. Right. A man. I mean, a I, man. it was like nightmare city trying to picture this poor girl being fitted, you know, into this, this image that her mother wanted her to. And as far as the father, I felt the father had, uh, um, my father wasn't like this exactly, but I mean, the descriptions of him, he had nothing to do with, with, with her. He couldn't even look at her. So, I mean, I thought he was so immersed in his business and that's what it was all about during this period of time. I mean, they were trying to make a living for their kids, but he, he was obsessed with the business, which is, which was typical, I guess, yeah, but yeah, yeah. anyway. Right, um Alice, and then Sandy, then Judy, and then Rochelle. Okay. So, you know, it's, it's so interesting to listen to everybody because we all have been able to identify with the story. My family was not in the um, garment industry, but I was the boss's daughter. My father had a business that I used to visit. And so I really related to her you know, being a young girl walking into your father's business and how at the beginning she said, you know, how people she had, she didn't want to have that identity as being the boss's daughter. She, she was her own person. And I, and I really identified with that because you walked in and people treated you a certain way because you were the boss's daughter. So I, I, I found that interesting. And I, and I also found it interesting you know, it was such a good description of what her father was like in his place of business. I don't know, maybe he was like that at home too, but it was just giving this insight into what he was like, how he treated people, how people treated him. And um, yeah, so I could identify with all of that and thought in just a few pages, how she really honed in and all of these different characters really so insightfully. And I, I yeah, really agree. Okay, Sandy, go ahead. And then 
um, Judy Biederman, Rochelle, and I see Andy and Marilyn. Loved the story, just loved it, identified with it because I was sort of built like that. I was very flat chested and very tall and I didn't fit into anything that my girlfriends would fit into. Most of my friends were short and busty and I just kept on growing. I was about five, 10 and a half at 12 years old, oh. continued on until I was six feet and always had problems getting fitted. And then when I got into my twenties and thirties, I needed to go shopping like this. I would look in a regular nice dress shop and look at the hems. That's all I looked at was the hems because if they didn't have a four inch hem that I could let down and put in a false hem and take these to my Greek dressmaker. I had a Greek lady who put a false hem in every dress that I owned. I mean, yeah. it, it was it was just so, I think we could all identify with uh, this character. It was so beautifully written. Yeah. But I I came in late this morning because I could get on. So Thank I wondered, you, what was the word glunk? What did that <laughs> symbolize? I, I think that was just her, you know, like she didn't swear or anything like that. It was just, I, I don't like this. Um, <laughs> I have Judy Biederman, Rochelle, Andy, Marilyn, Lynn. Well, first of all, I actually looked up clunk. Okay. It's a real word. And it's something like this. With your glasses way down there and you're peering over the top of them. So then I thought, well, maybe that's how they greeted her. So then I went back and I looked, but the quotation marks were Allegra's greeting them. So right. I'm not sure what it was about. Now, my experience was different. You can imagine, I was 12 years old and about 75 pounds, and I was a little thing. But I lived in a fairly small town, best in company would come to a hotel in Columbus and they do a drunk show. And that's where we went, my mother and me, sometimes my grandmother. And I got to pick out what I wanted and they ordered it and it came. And then I went to the dressmaker and no, I didn't. I never needed a bra till I was <laughs> way older than that. But the other thing was, the nature of the business. The garment business, I think, is still something like that. But it's been swamped by China and a lot of other cheap stuff. But they still, that's the nature. The fabric, the cuts, the buttons, the crap, whatever. But the way they treated her, she says they treat her like a princess. This. So it was all this reflected glory yeah. of being the boss's daughter. And yeah. I, I, you know, I think that. Um, oh, gunk. Yeah. I, I think that after COVID, you know, whether we have brick and mortar stores, and, you know, what her dad was that he was the intermediary, as was my grandma. Well, now you just get on the internet and you order hither and thither. So, it's going to change. Okay, Rochelle, Andy, and then Marilyn. First of all, I got a kick out of the expression place of business. I mean, that was such a, 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 a an expression that they used at, probably after the 50s, but now they say I'm going to work, you know, not my place of business. So I got a kick out of that. Um, Lynn had mentioned uh, that the father was so consumed with his business but I think it was way more than that. I no, cannot I believe he was so nasty. I think he was just a nasty person. And I think the mom was not the warmest person either. I think this child who was probably a, a preteen from my, what I thought, or maybe 13, I, I just thought she had a really rough time of it. She, she mentioned that her brother, or David, I guess it was yeah. her brother, 
got his uh, knickers in the mail in a box or something and didn't have to bother trying on things. I just, I just thought her family, I don't care, you know, how, how much business was important to their, their livelihood. I thought they were just not nice people. So I think she had a tough time. Uh, also, I just wanted to mention too, that when um, we all have memories, it all, tr it triggered things. And when I graduated from grade school, I was pretty skinny and my mom had to have an outfit made for me and um, it happened to have a bolero with it. So it was really cute, but um, I had it, it was made because it was the only way something would fit me properly at the time. It's changed, but um, that yeah. was then. So yeah. here we go. Yeah. Um, Andy, yeah. Okay. Uh, Marilyn, and then Merle and Ellen. Well, I think um, the relation, the, the secretary, was her name Agnes or Aunt something? I, I don't remember. I thought it was Agnes, but maybe it wasn't. Who, do, you know, he treated her, the father treated her so poorly, and yet she came to defend him. So was that more a, just a perspective of time that we, that's how it was then? And she could understand that. I, I think there was some of that that was acceptable. They didn't have Me Too or you know, har harassment or, um, I thought that was just interesting um, what, what she accepted and, and the daughter thought it was awful how he, her father talked to her. Well, she, definitely that, that was at the time, but even the person in the um, dressing room who touched her, you know, I, hopefully our kids today wouldn't stand for that. But, you know, I think that that's, you know, I, I remember going to Schwartz's for bras and I said, no, I don't want a man looking at me. Get me the lady. My yeah. mom's like, oh, and he's like, I've seen a million. I said, well, you're not seeing mine. Go get a woman. <laughs> like, ah, yeah. that's not happening. Yeah, yeah I, I think there's still some of that. I feel that way about certain things that I don't want Um you know, I, and I feel badly because I feel like, oh, I'm just a little bit, um, I have to have things an old way. And I, um, you know, like if I was having a massage, I prefer a woman. And I'm right I, with you. I, I, I took my massage and this guy who was, I was part, he said, well, I wouldn't even want to, you know, massage. That's just not a client I want to deal with if you have that prejudice. That's right. Um, okay. Um, uh, so I have Marilyn, Merle, Ellen, and then Lynn sell it. Marilyn, you got to unmute. I'm unmuting. There you go. Well, as many others, this story really resonated with me. Um, I grew up in fabric stores and then to the candy store, but first the fabric stores. My mother was a phenomenal designer and um, she was so talented. She started as a child with paper uh, newspapers underneath, I'm told by my aunts underneath the stairs of their house, she'd sit and make clothes for all her dolls. And then eventually the dolls became her sisters. She sewed all their clothes and their wedding dresses. And she was so talented that if Jackie Onassis would have seen her, um, she would have hired her. And we had people come to our house who owned designer stores. I don't know if you remember on, um, Devon Avenue was Dorothy Schreiber. It was a designer store for women who could afford designer clothing. And she was one of my mother's dearest friends. So she'd call my mother and say, Marsha, you must come. You're the only one who can take apart the designer gowns and put them back together. You have to, so my mother would go and help her. And so I spent a lot of time in the store uh, with my mother uh, watching all of this happen because they had a couch in the front of the store and the owners would greet the clients as they came in and then they had salespeople in the back room. But my dining room had a huge dining room table and a chest and the chest was filled with fabrics of all kinds. And I was with my mother when she purchased all these different fabrics. So, um, I understand that my great grandfather was a weaver and a tailor. And so all this came by her very honestly. I can still hear the humming of the sewing machine. It went day and night. 
And she made so much clothes for me that when the I'd put on a suit, she wouldn't just make the suit, she'd make the coat and she'd make the hat and she'd cover my shoes and handbags. And as I got older for prom, and she could cover all the dining room chairs and make the drapes. And that is fantastic. Uh, and I and, think it brings back a lot of memories. Yes. Um, okay. And, yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Um, yeah, sorry. Meryl. Okay. Okay, I, I thought it was a deeply feminist story. Um, I thought there was a lot of verbal abuse toward the women and the women were apologists for the bad behavior of Mr. Goldman. I thought the place, the title was very symbolic because I thought it represented a state of mind that she was always in a really unhappy place emotionally when she went there. So I thought that was a great title. And the fact that when she went there, the, the behavior toward her was dehumanizing. She was treated like a mannequin. Mm -hmm. So it was a very tough situation for her. But I had an immediate reaction to this story about something that happened to me that was similar. Um, someone in my family worked at Mandel Brothers in the dress department, packing dresses for shipment. So he had a discount. And I was always getting dresses from Mandel Brothers, whether I liked them or not. <laughs> They just knew my size and I was tense and I had to wear these dresses. And then I had another relative who was a buyer at Saks Fifth Avenue. And she heard that I had to go to a bar mitzvah party that was an evening party at a place called the casino, which was kind of a very grown up place. And she said, I'm getting you dressed. They're having a fantastic sale. So, and this was at the end of October. So she brings me this dress, it's this cotton, waffle pique with short sleeves and white trim around the sleeves and a little white collar. And it fit perfectly. It was a tangerine color, very cute. It fit perfectly, but it was the end of October and all of my friends were wearing velvet. <laughs> so, so I wore the dress. I think they gave me a sweater, but I thought kids have no choice at that age. Everything was imposed on the children. And I'm sure even our own daughters would say, I didn't like that outfit you bought me. <laughs> you know, there's always some. Well, see, that's where I, I disagree because one of the things that I was going to bring up and then we're going to go to Ellen G and Lynn Salad is that our kids today would never stand for that. My right. daughter, I, I'm trying to right. find the picture of what I wore at my bat mitzvah. My daughter would not, and my mother dressed me and, she wouldn't let me dress her when I was thir when she was 13. That, that just wouldn't happen. It just would uh, not happen. I thought that was what this story was about. This particular yes. time, this it's a period piece. We would never allow this now. Our children mostly chose their own clothes. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. but I thought it was a great story. And I Thank think you. it resonated Thank you. with everybody. Um, Ellen, not Ellen Gussell. I also thought that there was a lot of pain in this story, but I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> I mean, I think she survived and she's looking back and uh, telling it in a very funny way. And I think on page 214, she finally says, for Christ's sake, <laughs> you know, she realized, I mean, that was her family. <laughs> she didn't completely escape it. <laughs> Right. Right. But them. She's real uh, yeah. yeah. Um, Lynn Salick, go ahead. I think I forgot what I was gonna say. Oh, um, right. okay. One of the one thing I wanted to say is we have a we have a um growing social activist in this story. She is trying to rev up the the women in the in the factory to stand up for themselves. So um, of course, this when she starts, she said, I hated going there. I mean, this was so out of her realm. And I, someone mentioned to the father, I mean, we have so many, if you remember going to any kind of sensitivity training and they ask you, what are your roles? How many different roles do you have in your life? And you did this diagram of all the roles. Well, right. I think there people are playing roles in this story. The father has to play this role. This is his factory role. Though I think he's from a different generation. I mean, he, there's all kinds of pointing about what he dresses and how he speaks to people. But 
this woman who says, I feel safe here. Um, I think she really did feel safe there. And um, so I think we have to take it like that, uh, you know, take it for um, what these people have to do to survive in this, in this particular time. I felt that this, well, I don't know. I, I think that she's going back. I, re, I, I agree, she's reflecting on this. I had hated going there too. I hated going there. She talked about it a couple of times. And it says, she all, it says I felt, I always felt like a freak. And this is what happens to many of us going into any kind of situation that where we can't feel like ourselves, where we, we are playing a role. And um, they put her in that role. They right. put her in that role and she rebelled. Right. She on threw up at the end of the story. Right. On 209, <laughs> the chief reason I hated going there, though, was that it was the one place where I ent entirely lost any connection with the person I thought I was. Exactly. I became someone totally different. The boss's daughter. Exactly. Elaine, go ahead. Okay. Well, first of all, you have to remember the parents were children of the Depression. Okay, so that, I remember my mother talking about the depression and how they had to live and how they had to do it and how that was the moment that stuck with them. And, and you have to remember, even my husband, I don't think changed that many diapers. Men were not involved. When my daughter got married, and her husband went to the first pediatrician meeting, I was like, what? They're going, I mean, it was women's roles and men's role. And men came home and they worked and we were at home. And that was the way it is. And kids did not have a choice. You were not saying, oh, do you like this? Or do you not like that? How many times were we all told you're lucky to have this? When I was a child, I walked through the snow for six miles, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and that was the time. Now, maybe now we give the kids too much freedom. They they are disrespectful. We could go into all that, but oh, we could. maybe they 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 have too much choices and too much freedom, and maybe we think too much about what is going on. Everyone had their roles and and you did what was expected of you. Yeah, I mean, I Elaine, I totally agree with you. When I ran the school, you know, parents would say to me, I can't whatever with their kid. And I, I didn't, but I was this close to saying, you're the adult. They are, and even my own sister, don't tell her I told you this. She was <laughs> like, try to rationalize with a two-year-old. You cannot rationalize. <laughs> you just have to, you know, it's not snack time. I don't have to tell you why, it's just not. And we're done and we're over. And some of that's our personalities. But um, Izzy, um, this is what Izzy said. Um, she would have loved to have been here and we're recording this for her. We'll see if she, we'll have to quiz her and see if she watched it. Um, because she totally identifies with Allegra. She loved the story. She felt so sorry for her because her mother made all of her clothes from scratch, from patterns, until I was about eight or nine. And today, I think that would be like, wow. Um, she bought the patterns, the material, and I never. she never got to choose any part of it. I had to stand there while she pinned, who, you know, going for the fittings, um, and always wanted a regular store-bought dress that I could actually pick out. She made the dresses with huge hems like Sandy was telling us, that she let down as I grew. I always had to wear the same clothes as I grew. Everyone thought I was so lucky that my mom made my clothes. Glunk, she says. <laughs> um, so, you know, we, we all have these, we are all bringing these experiences, Lynn Salad and then Andy. I thought it was really um, uh, puzzling and maybe some of you can clarify this on the bottom of 214 she starts substituting glunk with her father's words did you notice that um she says glunk i mean it you'd be surprised how many women do it 
for Christ's sake, I said, and this is what the father can, how do you like the nice polka dot, Allegra? It has a nice little bolero jacket. It'll cover up your chest. How the hell many dresses are you getting for her, for Christ's sake, my father said. Where the hell is she going in all those dresses on a cruise? Yeah, well, where the hell am I going, I said. Okay, what's going on here? Well, yeah, did somebody, Joyce, did you want to, and then Andy. Joyce, you have to unmute. Yeah, Joyce, maybe your other, we can't hear you. You're gonna have to put it in the chat. All right, <laughs> never mind. All right, Andy. Well, I this is not about that, although oh. um, maybe she just sort of gave up at that point. But um, what I thought was interesting was her name. I, I thought that name <laughs> must have meant that her parents really wanted her to be something, you know, else than who she was from the get-go, because that was not a name. Did you know anybody? I mean, I didn't know anybody who had the name Andrea and I hated it, but um, you know, I, I just thought Allegra, where does that in a Jewish situation um, that it was just an interesting. Yeah, the only yeah. Allegra I know is Allegra, Allegra Goodman and she's another author. So that's kind yeah, of Yeah, I mean, now I wouldn't think anything. Yeah, she's, she's probably a little younger. And, you know, yeah. I don't know. My, you um, know, I know why I got my name, but. Um, yeah. Um, Merle? Um, I, I thought that, well, I think Allegra in general, like in Spanish, Alegria, it's, it's a name that means happy. It's, a, it's an ironic name, actually. It might be a Hebrew name, too. Um, mm. I think that, but it means happy. It's a very, it's, it's not a name that you would give this girl, but I thought she really won in the end. I think whatever was bothering her, she expressed it in a way that usually five-year-olds can do that. Four-year-olds and five-year-olds know how to do that if they're unhappy about something. And I thought the ending was perfect because she finally got to express what she wanted to say by throwing up <laughs> yeah. and ruining the dress. Yeah, right. Valero, was, right. Yes. Um, so I, I finally found the picture. Um, what, when I went for my bat mitzvah dress, which I think we got at Bonwood Teller, which I don't think exists anymore. And I'm sure, now I liked it, but my, um, my mom picked it out and I'm on the far left with that bow. Can you imagine? <laughs> A 13 year old, like my daughter uh, became about mitzvah in 2001. When she sees this picture, um, my sister is not next to me, but the next one over with the white and the blue. And the person next to me is a very from woman today. And if she, if her people got a hold of this, it, it would just be hilarious. So, uh, you know, oh, Alice, go ahead. Yeah, wait, this, wait, am I on a yeah, I can go back. Okay. No, you're good. Okay, this, okay, okay. I, I lost, anyways. Oh, this is so funny to see that dress, Vanessa, because my daughter had a dress like that, but she was four or five years old. <laughs> it, I, I mean, she would, you know, this is, that this was so funny to see that as a Bob Mitzvah dress, but that- Listen, I, 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 I used to come, I used to go, if I'm invited to a B'nai Mitzvah, I go. And I used to come home and I, I would be fuming for two reasons. One, the girls look like, um, I can't even think of a nice word to say how the girls look like. S-L-U-T. Yes. Um, and, and like they were 21. And the boys, you know, had on a tie and a shirt and, you know, and they'd be talking, 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 talking. And I would come home, you know, like enraged every Shabbat and tell my kids, you better not do that. And um, you're right. We have, and you've seen this with girls that they become more sophisticated. And, you know, I think that their bodies change earlier because of what we're eating. And, um, you know, it's not, it's not all good. Breathing. But I just wanted to say, breathing. I, I just wanted to say one of the last lines in the story, I think is really important. The mother says to her, it's all in your head. Yeah. And she's saying that as like, you know, forget about it. She's not yeah. hurting, but it's all in your head. That's you. That yeah. is, I mean, 
I mean, that was so denigrating to her. But yes, it is all in your head because that's what you're feeling and that's what you're experiencing. So I thought that was like really, yep. really a tough thing for a mom to say, but I, under, I understand. And I think it was something that was probably said to a lot of us back in the 50s. <laughs> it's all in your head. I mean, I, I so appreciate how we're looking at this story through the eyes of 2021 and our experiences because, um, and that's why I've really loved this book. It just takes you back to a different time, a different way to parent, a different way to be Jewish, just different and things that, um, and I think everyone in this group can remember back when, and it'd be interesting how a younger woman would read this book and say, well, I don't, I don't you know, how does this resonate uh, or so on and so forth. Um, this, this um, Judy. The one Judy. thing at the very end is she's pinned to her slip. <laughs> and it's like pinning her to the role that they have assigned her and mm -hmm. they don't really think, but she gets, she throws up all over that role and that slip and ruins. Wrong. <laughs> so if you think back, I don't know about those of you who don't belong to Macomb, Salil, but there used to be pictures of all the confirmation classes and they go like today and look at them and say did you make me wear that dress <laughs> and i want to remind you that you picked out that dress yourself you went to the style shop and you picked it out and style shop yes. <laughs> so it wasn't all our fault yes they, you know it's at the, i thought a good point yeah. for what adolescence is. Um, we used we used to have all of our confirmations pictures up at Legacy Lakeside, and there was this one 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 young woman who I adore. But we used to take the pictures on a different night, and she had on black and white stockings. And I so I said, "Listen, if we're you have to remember if you're coming dressed up." wear the right shoes. And I would show that girl every time. Um, okay, I have Marilyn, Andy, and then Sandy. Uh, Marilyn, you need to unmute. Okay. I was thinking about the pattern, the importance of a pattern. When you cut out a pattern, you can mold or create uh, just what you want as you uh, cut it and pin it. She was not going to be the pattern that her parents wanted. And the old expression where you threw away the pattern, well, she threw away the pattern. And um, I gave her a lot of credit for standing up. Um, I spent a lot of time in millinery stores and being pinned and uh, turn, turn, pin. And but you have to do it now. I don't want to do it now. My friends are coming over. No, you got to do it now. And so I can remember, you know, being in places that I didn't want to be, but I did want and, and enjoy the beautiful things that came as a result of that, those uh, talents. But a young girl um, doesn't care about that. She wants to wear what everybody else is wearing. And, um, my mother used to say, wear out, wear out the things I'm making for you, and then you can go to Carol Core. But first wear these gorgeous wool pants, and everybody else was wearing clothes from Carol Core and Marshall Fields. And I I could feel for this young woman. Um, yeah, I, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> we have Andy, Sandy, and then Lynn Salad. Well, um, Vanessa, you I think you asked the question about how a younger generation would look at this story. But I wonder if, you know, feelings are eternal. You know, what we put ourselves through or what the young girls now, maybe they don't want to be pushed into looking like they're 18. Exactly. They wear something that is so uncomfortable and that just because they want to fit in, just like at every age, I think, you know, the majority want to fit in. Um, kudos to the ones who can 
you know, work out on their own and just say, this is what I'm wearing and I'm not fitting in. But I think that pressure is, is there. And I think it's probably you'd hear that. But I, I once went to a Seder and took my daughter, a woman Seder, and she said, this is Jessica, she said, um, would you have let us go out like that? Because there was some other mother at the another table with a daughter dressed what Jessica considered inappropriate. Um, and I said, and I said, well, I don't know what else is going on in their house. And you know, Very you know, diplomatic I, of you. Yeah, I think that these are universal kind of themes that yeah. are coming. You could, you could absolutely be right, um, Sandy, and then Lynn. Worse than the dresses was the problem that I had because I wore size 10 and a half shoe and nobody made women's shoes in those sizes in that day. So my wonderful mother, and she really was lovely. And she was old when she was old, when she had me, she took me down to Leo's every time there was a party. And whatever dress I was wearing, she had them dye a pair of ballet shoes for me so that I wouldn't be so tall. So for my sister's wedding, my graduation from elementary school, I had turquoise, I had pink, I had every color ballet shoes to go with the dress. And other girls would just be starting to wear a little wheel and they looked so cute and so grown up. And here was I, very, very thin, very tall, very small busted in my ballet shoes. I, I really could cry when I think of those years, but my mother did what she thought was best for yeah, me. Yeah, your mother did. That is absolutely, and it's a lovely memory. Um, mm -hmm. Lynn, what were you gonna say? I was gonna say two things. One, at the end of the story, I think the mother comes around on 214, she said, that looks very nice on you. Don't you think that looks nice, Allegra? I glanced into the mirror and made a face. Well, do you like it or don't you? You're the one who's going to have to wear it. And I remember my mother saying that to me, you know, do you like this or don't you? Um, it's the first time we see that she's given some kind of choice um, in, in how she's going to be. So I thought I, I, I liked that her mother was coming around. Second of all, I mean, there's pieces of the story I, I mentioned about why she's now imitating her father. I think it's, it's um, uh, an attempt maybe to get a little closer to him, I don't know. But also that incident where she talks about picking up fragments of the materials on the, on the floor uh, as a treasure and um, I mean, that's open to interpretation too. I mean, I'm wondering if she's gathering fragments to try to piece herself together into some kind of- But she said she threw them out. She did throw them out because nothing, nothing fits. Nothing it, the, pieces, the pieces just didn't go together. But she kept trying. <clears throat> she kept trying. <clears throat> and I think um, that the story again is, and, and the, all the other stories, this kid is trying to find her identity yeah. and she sees all the roles that people can play and she doesn't fit in to any of these roles right now. So and, um, it's a beautiful adolescent coming of age kind of story where you're realizing, I don't you know, this is not for me. I'm rejecting this, this, but she liked the role of being an activist. So yeah. from what you said, she was in her adult, in her adult life. Um, so these stories, Zmira, Lil Lum, L Olam and White Shell Woman, Sour or Suntan, It Makes No Difference in the Place. Um, there, um, it's called Part th Three, Wider Glimpses. Um, why do you think they called it Wider Glimpses? Um, Ellen Gusset, and you'll have to unmute. Yeah, well, it's a starting of assimilation, I think. They're, you know, they're branching out and being with diverse cultures and, and coming to their own conclusions. Right. You know, let alone a, a daughter, in the, you know, in this case, where she's, she's trying to um, show her own um, individuality against parents who've got different ideas for her, which is always the case with anybody growing up. 
On page 13, Jewish women writers have increasingly turned to themes of acculturation, conflict between generations, and the secular and religious meanings of Judaism. Um, and next week, we start the past as the present. Um, the shawl is our story it, yeah. for next week, and um, it's not easy. I'll, I'll preface it with that. Um, it's a lot to talk about, and I can't wait to hear what you all say about it. But, um, you know, we're starting in with, um, you know, Cynthia Ozick, um, and um, who I actually think has a new book out this year. Can I say a word about uh, the future? Yes. In terms of picking out a book. Yes. I went through the, um, and I told Vanessa this, I went through the bios of all of these authors. And some of them have short story books uh, that they have written. And um, I think we'd like you to begin thinking about which of the stories you've liked the best and whose stories you would like to read more of. And if that's the case, we can take a book of short stories written by one author. Now we've done that with Joyce before and it worked, it worked well. So um, we can do that or we can do something else. But so begin thinking about which of these stories were your favorites and whose style and there's you a lot, like. There's a many new um, short stories out because this is from a certain time period. Um, and um, I, I've been reading some of them to, you know, get ahead of the curve here. That next, isn't oh, okay. it the week after next? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Thank you, I have to go. Bye, Ellen. Yeah, bye, um, bye. We meet again on March 3rd, I think. Okay, thank yeah. you. Does that make sense? Bye, everyone. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Vanessa, I have a question before you. Before yes. you. I'm here, I, I'm here. I could not hear any audio. I saw everybody, you know, you must have, you had admitted me originally when we were in the car. I've Zoomed before in the car. Is there a reason why I couldn't hear anything? Do you know? So I was saying to you, oh, but you did, you couldn't I hear, didn't it. hear it. So yeah. um, did you turn up your volume on your I did. phone? The volume on the radio was way up and the volume on my phone was at maximum. And I didn't know if it was going to go through the phone or not. And I thought I should have had my earbuds with me, but I didn't. Yeah. How do you connect the earbuds to the phone? You have to go into settings. And then you, okay. All right. March 3rd, I'm going to be traveling. So I'm going to miss the shawl. We did it uh, years ago, but I would have liked to do it again, but I will miss that. But hopefully I'll be with you two weeks later from California. And I, that's why I asked about the earbuds because I okay. might need them. Oh my God, California. Uh, <laughs> I know, sun <laughs> and no snow. And all no right, snow. I'll well, if I don't see you, have, a, well, great, be have well. a great time. Take it's care. And I'll see you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.